you know, it's an amazing thing to get to be a part of people's lives who have given so much to you and to everyone that served. I want to say thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. And for those who are now serving, we want to continue to pray for you that God would protect you and bless your families. I shared in the first service that over the nine years that I've served as pastor here, I've grown to even appreciate more what it costs for freedom. I've always been a proud, proud person of our nation, proud of and supported our military, but over the last nine years, actually getting to pastor a church that has so much uh, connection to the military, I've really grown to understand. I didn't, in, I didn't know partly what it took to be free. And so again, to all you men and women and to all the families, thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart. And I salute you for, for your sacrifice, and I thank you for all that you've done. You know, we have a blessed nation, amen? amen? We are a blessed nation. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalm 33, verse 12. I shared again in the first service that uh, I had to work hard praying uh, about this message because I believe, my friends, that, that we have been the greatest nation in the history of the world. And I believe that we have the greatest nation in the world. And I believe that we are a nation that's in, in trouble. And so I had to be real careful because I didn't want to stand up here for uh, 20 minutes on my stopwatch here, 20 minutes, wagging my finger at people and saying how bad you are and how you need to straighten up and work and get this nation back. I, I wanted to be real careful because as I've shared with you before, you don't need me standing up here giving you my opinion. You don't need me standing up here giving you a lecture on my thoughts of the, of the state of this nation. What you and what those watching at home need is for God's Word to speak to your heart because it's God's Word that's going to impact you anyway. And so today I want to share a message out of Psalm 33, verse 12. And let's go ahead and in honor of God's Word. Let's stand so that we can, can read His Word. The psalmist writes here in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, or some say God is Jehovah, the people He has chosen as His, as his own inheritance father we thank you for today we thank you for the blessings you've given us and we again thank you for a great nation thank you for the men and women who have given so much so that we can uh, be here today without any worries and father i pray for our nation i pray that god you would continue to guide us and strengthen us and i pray for this word that you have laid on my heart this morning that god it would be not my words, but yours. And I pray, God, that this would not be my message more than any time that I've asked, but, Lord, that it be your message. And, God, that the response would be from, from your people as you desire for it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. You know, again, I, I believe that we have the greatest nation in the world. And I believe that we have... We're, we're not perfect. Uh, we're not anywhere close but i believe we truly are great and this week we celebrate the greatness of our nation we celebrate the birth of our nation and i believe that i believe in something that i believe is not a very popular word today and that word is american exceptionalism a lot of people don't like people being using that word they definitely don't like it being used from the pulpit because what that is saying is that we feel that we have a great nation and that we have a nation that others should aspire to be like. And a lot of people now are saying, whoa, no, no, no. You can't say that. You've got to kind of blend us all in together. My friends, listen to me. For us to deny the greatness of America is to deny the greatness of God. Because we are blessed, not because of us, but we are blessed according to this scripture because of God himself. And even in our imperfections, even in the struggles that we have, the trials that we have, we are still blessed. So what I want to do very quickly, look at just a couple of things. What is blessed? When it says blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord or God is Jehovah, what is it? That means that we're happy and we're at peace. Now, I don't mean at peace with the world, but I mean that we as a nation, we as individuals even, are happy when God is, is, is Lord over us. When we follow Him, when He is the one that we decide to place up in the forefront of our lives and to follow after, after His claims, man, there's a happiness that comes with that. There's a peace 
that comes along with serving God and being obedient to Him. But there's also is a condition that is desirable. In other words, when we are following after God, when we are blessed, people are going to look at us and desire what we have. Because people will look and say, that is a nation that we need to be like. So what is blessed? Blessed is just that, that God is working in us. God is doing some great things in us. God is doing some great things for us. So we are a blessed nation, and we need to claim that this morning. We need to celebrate that this morning, and we need to honor that this morning. And all this week, as we head toward July 4th, next weekend, we need to be celebrating the freedom that God has given us because, again, we are blessed. And the question then is, why then? Why then are we blessed? Because it's not, again, because we are good boys or good little girls. It's that God has been working in us because God has used us as a vessel. What, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that I, I want you to understand what I believe. And I believe it through history, I believe it through the writings, but I believe that the United States of America were founded on Judeo-Christian values. Let me say that again. I believe that the United States of America was founded and created on Judeo-Christian values. There you go. And that we were following at those men who put together this nation, set it apart, that God blessed them and God ordained them, God set them, and that because they established it, the United States of America since that time has been used as a vessel. God wants to use us. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God is looking for people that he can show himself strong to, but also show himself strong, strong through. That he wants to, to reveal himself to us. I mean, God wants to stand before us and show his wonderfulness, show his mightiness, show his power to us. And as we receive him into our lives, as we place him in the forefront of our lives, as we follow after him, what he will then do is in turn show himself powerful to the world through us on our behalf. He will use us as that vessel. Again, not because we're better, but because where we placed God. So what we see then is that God blesses us and we are, can, can I tell you this? And, and again, I know the things that I'm saying today would just, it's going to rub people wrong if they're, if they're watching this and that's not my intent. But can I tell you today that God has blessed the United States of America to, he's used us to bless the, the world. Can you understand what a blessing this nation is to the world? Now, that's not being conceited. It's not because of us. It's not because of me. But listen to me. He uses us as a vessel because of, and, and in our resources. That we share the blessings that we have throughout the world. As a matter of fact, any time that there is a catastrophe in the world today, who is the number one con uh, contributor to to, to finances and to aid and assistance. It's the United States of America. Because God is blessing us. Now, again, not because we're good boys and girls, because he knows that we're founded and our, our, our mentality is that we want to help people. And so we take those resources and we, we distribute them out. Man, we help. We, we give aid to countries in need. He, he allows us to be a vessel. But not only that for for that to be an example to people in the resources, but also in sharing of the gospel. God uses America to spread the gospel around the world. A lot of the missionaries come from here to go around the world. And what's even better, do you, do you realize where a, la a, a large portion of missionaries, do you know where they surrender to the mission field? At a place in central Oklahoma, south central Oklahoma, called Falls Creek. A lot of people surrender their lives to missions at Falls Creek, right in our own backyard. So we now go from here and we, we spread the gospel around the world. God is using America as a vessel. And listen to me, we are blessed and God is using us as a vessel because we have placed him in the forefront of our lives of a nation. 
But let me tell you something. The very moment we begin to not do that, then we're not going to be blessed because we're not going to be different than anybody else. So we, God has been using us as a vessel. The second thing is he's been using us as a city on a hill. In, in the first video, Ronald Reagan talked about that, sitting as a shining light on the hill, a shining city on the hill. The Bible tells us in, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, 14, says you, and he's talking about Christians, he's talking about any of those who will allow their lives to be used of God. He said you then, you as, a, as, as an individual, you as a family, uh, we as a church, and we as a nation, we that allow God to be established in, in our lives, we are uh, the light, we are the light of the world. The city that's placed on a hill or set on a hill cannot be hidden. So he uses us, and, 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 and we, we've talked a lot about different things in the world, how people desire to, to come and be a, a part of what we have going on. They, they, they desire freedom. We are that light of freedom that shines to the world. That's why so many people don't like the United States. Those who are in power, those who are dictators, they hate America. Why? Because America is blessed with freedom. And we are that city of freedom on a hill. And listen to me, a desire, there is a desire in every individual. I don't care who you are, there is a desire to be free. And we are that city placed on a hill, an example of freedom, to shine as an example. Many of you who've traveled around the world, you, especially in the military, you know that the United States is not like other nations. You know that our mindset is not the same as other nations. You know that we think differently even about life than some other nations do. So we are that example of, of what life is and what life should be because God is working in us and He changes our mindset. He changes who we are. We've talked about that weeks and weeks. For people to see this light. But also, again, to shine the gospel. We're, we're to shine the gospel to the world. God has given us, do you understand that God has given us even greater opportunities to shine that gospel now through the internet? That, we, that First Baptist West is now able to get the message around the world. Wow. That's pretty cool. And you know what? We don't have to worry. <laughs> We're maybe beginning to have to, but we don't really have to worry about anyone censoring this, telling us, coming and shutting us down. Maybe after today we might. I don't know. But we are to get the gospel out to the world, my friends. But let me, let me share something with you. A city on a hill is a great example but can I tell you this, that a city on the hill is also a target. Amen? A city on a hill with the light shining, because it says, let your light so shine before men. And a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, that's good. That's really good when, you, when it's a positive beacon. <laughs> it's not quite so good when you're a target. Again, you folks in the military, you'll, you'll know what that means. When your enemy's around, you don't want to start flashing lights and telling them where you are. Can I tell you today that there are a lot of people who desire to destroy our way of life? Because we are that light. And because we are that light, they, the many, in, many in the world, many in this own nation want that light to be snuffed out. They want that light to not shine so brightly to, to outshine or overshine other people. So city on a hill is a good thing, but it's also knowing to understand that the clock, that, 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 that the target is there. And, and in closing, let me share this very quickly. Just got a few more minutes. Can I tell you something? Our clock is ticking. America's clock is ticking. 
I shared with you at the beginning that we are the greatest nation in the history of the world and great civil, we're a great civilization. Do you realize if you'll go back in history that most great civilizations that, be, that were like what we are, they, the, the most they lasted was roughly about 200 years. Because after about 100 and so years, things begin to change and mentalities change. And the next thing you know, deterioration happens and that civilization only lasted maybe 200 years before it had a heavy, heavy decline. America has been over 240 years. But friends, I'm going to tell you today, it's easy to see our clock is ticking. Because we are that city on a hill. And by being city on a hill, we are a target. And what I've done is, I, I, I may have used this once before, but there, there's a man named Alexander Tyler. And what Alexander Tyler did was he began to study history. He began to study civilizations. And in closing, I want to share this with you. There are eight stages of the rise and fall of a civilization. And this is proven true throughout history. The first stage is from bondage to spiritual growth. That, that somehow, some way, they, a people, that civilization started out in bondage, started out under servanthood of, of another group, and they were held down. And then all of a sudden they began to grow spiritually because what begins to happen is, is when somebody is held down, we, we begin to look and we begin to find a way to, to get better, to, to do more. And through this, even in our nation, that we began to seek God and His principles and we established a place. And so from that spiritual growth, we had courage. Throughout the Bible, over and over and over, the Bible says, fear not, be not afraid. Listen, we, not are, we are not given, listen, we are not given a spirit of fear. As Christians, we are not given that spirit of fear. We are not given that spirit of bondage. So it tells us, be brave, be strong, be of good courage. And so once, they, once we find God strengthening and, and encouraging us, then we go from, uh, from courage to liberty, finding that freedom. That courage that, to, to act on that desire for all people to be free. So we go and we have from courage to freedom to liberty. And then from liberty we go to abundance. Now this is true in history. And I'm not an economics person. I'm a math person. Amen? I, I taught math. I'm a basketball person. And now I'm a Bible person, I hope. But I didn't teach economics. But I'm here to tell you it doesn't take long to figure out that free people that have freedom, they gain abundance. Free enterprise works. The idea of being able to do what you want, to achieve your dreams, that's an amazing goal, amen? That's, that brings about abundance because we begin to get successful in doing those things. So from we go from freedom to having an abundance. But, then what happens is we go from abundance to complacency. Now, an abundance to complacency is where we, we, we've had and we continue to have and then we begin to get complacent with it. We begin to feel like it's always going to be that way. We've always had it. We always will. Can I tell you that's not true? But we go from abundance to complacency. And then the next thing is from complacency to apathy. We go from thinking it's always going to be that way to really not caring. We just, let's do it. If it's there, fine. If it's not, fine. And the reason we can say if it's there, fine. If it's not, fine. Because, my friends, the majority of us have never had it not there. You know, that's why a lot of people say, if I have it, fine. If I don't have it, fine. It's because they've never, had it. they've never not had it. We have generations, my generation, and those after me, we really don't know overall what it's like to be in great need. Generations before us do. Now, I grew up poor, dirt poor. But as I grew up dirt poor, I still had more than most people in the world had. We joke around my house. Man, my daughters, 
th their, their idea of poor is maybe not having enough to, to get whatever they want when they want it. They still have a house, they still have a car, they still have this, they still have that. But it's the idea of thinking it's always going to be there and then really not caring because it's, if it's there, fine. If it's not, fine. Not having that desire to work and to strive and to, to do whatever we, we can do to make it. Then we go from apathy to dependence. Because we don't care enough to do it ourselves, we're going then to depend on someone else to do it for us. So we can rely on someone else. Let someone else do it. I will receive from it. I will not have to work hard. I will not have to strive. I will not have to sacrifice. Because somebody, and usually it's in a centralized place, that will then begin to distribute it out to all of those who don't have, and then you become dependent upon them to provide for you. You're no longer providing for yourself. And then we go from that dependency, guess what? Back into bondage. Can I tell you this? That once you begin to depend on somebody, they have you. Amen? When you begin to depend on somebody for your well-being, they have you. Why? Because it's their stuff. Or they call it their stuff. Because you're getting it for free. What do you care? And so now we're back to being in bondage. We don't get to make the decisions ourselves any longer. It's no longer ours. It's somebody else getting to make the decision because they claim that stuff for their own and they're now giving it to me. And who am I to question because I didn't, get, I didn't work for it anyways? Oh, preacher, that's not ever going to happen in America. My friends, it's happening in America. We have to be very careful. That's why we, hey, do you understand? That's why we do stuff like this today. It wasn't that we just wanted to find something to do. So let's work and build all this up. No, we, we, we want to make sure that people understand. We know where our blessings come from. We want to celebrate the freedom. Because my friends, freedom can be taken away. Once you become dependent upon somebody, you are no longer free. As a matter of fact, and I want to close with this quote, Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for. It must be protected. And it must be handed on for them to do the same thing that the generation after us must defend and must protect this freedom must fight for this freedom. But listen to me. If you're apathetic, you're not going to fight for anything. If you don't care, you're not going to fight for anything. And he goes on to say that we must do the same or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free wow you and I must continue to celebrate our freedom we must continue to fight for our freedom we must continue to demand our freedom and if we don't pass that down to our young people if we don't pass it down to them we will one day have to explain even to their kids what it once was like. How many of you even today will look and say, oh, I remember the good old days. I remember when, and you begin to name some things that were amazing that we're no longer doing, that we don't get to enjoy anymore. 
Do you remember those days? This is what Ronald Reagan was talking about. This is what you and I, this is why we celebrate our freedom. This is why we must teach what freedom means. This is why we must teach what freedom uh, what freedom costs. This is where we must was understand why we even have freedom. Because God has blessed us. And if, listen to me, if we continue to move, remove God from the forefront of our, of our own personal lives, from our families, from our churches, and from our nation, we will not be a blessed people any longer. Because what good are we as a vessel to God? So my friends, we are in a time where I believe the clock is ticking for our nation. And I believe we, as God's people, need to first and foremost recommit ourselves to placing Him forefront of our lives. We must. We as the church, we must begin to be that example and promote Christ being in the center and the forefront of other people's lives by giving the gospel out. We as the church must be living our lives in such a way that we can show Christ blessing us and working in us, not blessing us with great cars and great houses and great stuff, but God blessing us with peace and encouragement. Folks, we must begin to teach that. We must begin to show that as an example. And listen, might I say, we might get to where we need to be demanding that. God to be the forefront. Because when we cease being the vessel that God can use, we will cease to be that great nation. Because why would He bless us? Why would He keep blessing us? Except that we be that vessel. The Bible says, I was looking about looking for someone, looking for anyone to be those people to stand in the gap. Do you know what the heartbreaking thing to that was, the conclusion of that verse? And I couldn't find anyone. Right here, God is looking for people, men and women. He's looking for a country to stand in the gap for this world. And up for over 240 years, I believe the United States of America has been that. We have tried to stand in the gap. We better keep standing. Would you join me in praying for our nation? Would you join me in praying that we would put God first in our lives, first in our our hearts and our minds, that we as as a people, and then we as a church, and then we as a nation would continue to seek God And stand for the freedom that he's given us. Stand for the goodness that he bestows upon us. Would you do it with me? In just a moment, we're we're going to have the praise team come back up. And they're going to sing a song. And what we're going to do is one of a couple things. You're going to stand with us and you're going to sing. Or you're going to stand with us and you're going to come front and begin to pray. If God's speaking to your heart about anything, we want you to come. Or we're going to ask you then, if you need to just stay right there where you are and and pray we're going to ask those at home to do the same thing sing along with us or just pray or maybe if if by some chance you you need to visit with somebody right now i'm telling you we have people that will visit with you all you have to do is call first baptist west and someone will be visiting with you because we don't want anyone to need something and and not have somebody there would you call us let me lead you in prayer, and then we're going to step into that time. And just, just let, God, let God's Spirit speak to your heart. Father, hear us today. God, hear us. Use us. Work in us today. With whatever you need to do, Lord, speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?